Hi there. Um, I'm um, Lisa Smith um, from sunny Hawke's Bay, and it's certainly a pretty hot one today, around um, 27 um, degrees. Um, uh, just close the curtains. Okay. So, yes, uh, I uh, um, have been a paediatric nurse for about 35 years, and probably for half of that I have... Uh, worked at the hospital dealing with um, bowel and bladder um, problems and toileting problems in um, children. Um, as a mum, I have lived experience of uh, dealing with uh, children uh, with additional uh, needs. And uh, my boy um, was diagnosed at the age of six with um, fetal alcohol spectrum um, disorder. So certainly, uh, yeah, sorting out his toilet training, uh, yeah, it did take, it was quite a challenge and it did, it, it did taste my um, patience to um, the limit. So today's talk is about um, toilet, toilet tactics um, for kids with additional um, needs. So I will um, put that up now, get started. All right, so this is what I'm going to cover in today's talk, which really just some facts around uh, continents and children who have disabilities or additional needs. And um, yes, it certainly is a journey of um, discovery and it will test you to the absolute limit. And I'm just going to give you a seven Ps for um, toilet training. And this is something that I have used in every area of my uh, personal and professional life. Personal as a parent of a child with a very challenging um, behaviours due to the brain damage. Um, but also professionally uh, in the um, children's ward, um, trying to support um, children um, with um, procedures and learning, um, you know, to take um, inhalers, medication, uh, you, you know, um, getting prepared for um, blood tests. Um, I, I use that, you know, to teach them new Things. So I always have in the back of my mind my seven P's, okay, for all things to do with um, children. Um, I've got this up here is meet your child where they're at and not where the world um, expects them um, to be. Um, focus on the strengths in your child. Focus on on their interests, because often that's what will get buy-in for them to change and uh, learn something new. Uh, with my boy, it was cars. Okay, that was his his reward. That was his thing that that would make him do anything. And you know what I will say is that you know be be realistic and don't you know like we all know don't compare your child with another child. Don't compare your child with the same condition as another child with the same condition because they're all unique, they're all different and they all have different learning um, styles. And hey, we're the, we know them so well. So, you know, we're the best teachers to, be, to help them um, with um, toilet um, training. But what I will say is, is be realistic. You know, and for some, that really, you know, may just be that they're, they're independ independent with toileting, but with support, semi-independent. Um, it may never be that they will be um, fully um, independent um, with um, their um, continents. So really, that's what I have just said. There's no magic recipe that uh, you have to make your own recipe book for your child, um, for just about everything, really, you know, because even as parents, we um, are, are often going to meet going to meetings and um, educating lots of people about our um, child's um, disability and their um, specific um, needs. So this, this webinar is really just going to go over 
um, some of the principles and just give you sort of a few ideas really um, on, on how you should uh, go on this journey of discovery um, with your child. So toilet training, okay, it's hard. And, but it, honestly, it's the most exciting milestone that you will reach with your child. Even just little steps to success. Yes, they've sat on the toilet, you know. Um, this, is, this is a big deal, you know, for some um, children. And it is complex and it involves the whole child. And really, we've got to look at what, what developmental level they are at. Uh, encompasses physiologically, physiological, developmental, and behavioral processes all at once, and it can take a lot longer. But it's it's a goal worth achieving because it will improve the quality of life for the child and um, the um, family. And I'm just going to give you an example of how complex it is now. You know, I remember, it, to me, it's just like um, trying to drive a car because you've actually got to use, um, you've actually got to use uh, all, all of your limbs to, you know, hands on the steering wheel, feet on the pedals. Um, in the UK, we hardly have automatic cars. It was manual. And so you were, you're having to fiddle with these three pedals that were on the floor that you didn't see. Um, and then you've got to have the eyes on, eyes on the front looking out, eyes at the back and eyes at the side. And then when you're having to change gear, I would often stall it because you've also got to listen to the engine so that you know that it's, it's okay. You know, you've got to, um, you know, step up, take off the pedal, you know. So, hey, it is really difficult. And change for our kids who have additional needs is hard. Once they have got into a, a habit, whatever that may be, it's, it can be harder to break. So when to start? As I say, the... Um, the I'll just move me up a little bit. Okay, there we are. So, yeah, um, the American Academy and the Canadian Pediatric Society, around about 18 to 24 months. So really, for our kids, like, you know, my lad, uh, you know, at the age of four, was functioning around maybe a one and a half to two year old level. Um, I did probably start a bit early and it backfired and I reset. And then we did eventually get there, um, you know, round about four, four and a half years of age. So most children can be continent by um, five years of age. So the facts, okay, you're looking at one in 20 kids between five and 14 having some form of physical, mental, or learning disability that will have an impact on them achieving um, their milestones. And continence um, is four times higher in, in children who have, uh, you know, additional uh, needs. And there was a study done um, on um, about 109-year-old kids who had a combination of physical and mental disability. And by the age of nine, only 39, about 40% were continent. So that's, that's you know, um, uh, that's the reality. Um, and one thing that came out of this study is only 9.9% .9 actually had a good fluid intake. Most of them were only taking about one cup of water a day. So... You know, a number of studies, um, again, um, it has been predominantly in Down syndrome, um, that there is a higher incident of bladder and bowel um, dysfunction. And it should not just be because they've got some form of physical 
um, intellectual learning disability. That that there is um, a dis disproportionately high prevalence of renal and urinary tract dysfunction in a number of um, kids, particularly Down syndrome. And a constipation and celiacs is another, uh, uh, um, is more common in Down syndrome. So really, if you're in doubt, then, you know, do consult your GP, do consult your pediatrician. You know, you, you be that, you know, cog in the wheel or whatever. You be that um, that squeaky wheel and, um, you know, get it investigated further because that can all have an impact on whether we're going to be um, successful um, with um, toilet training and for them to be um, continent. So the extra challenges that we have. Hmm. And um, certainly... Uh, they have very busy what I call tigger brains or meerkat brains. And um, they, hey, it's not on their agenda. They're too busy. They want to just play. And so they will hold on. They will ignore the signs from their um, brain. And um, if they hold on, then you're going to um, have a bowel and bladder that's going to not work as well for um, them. And that will hinder the whole process of toilet training. Along with that, you you know, within kids that have additional needs, um, there are they've got real um, sensory issues, sensory sensitivities, which can lead to them, uh, you know, um, toilet fears and avoiding and not wanting to go anywhere near. Um, the toilet. Uh, a number have um, communication issues. Um, I've got a boy the now with um, charge um, syndrome. Um, he does have um, developmental delay. It's probably functioning about a three-year-old um, level. Low IQ. He's deaf and wears cochlear implants. He's partially blind. And um, yeah, it's it's um, proven to be, you know, really um, difficult. And um, he was constipated as well. And mum wasn't sure that often he would just roll up into a fetal position. And um, she, she kind of wondered, is there something um, not right? But, um, you know, constipation can be quite um, sneaky. And kids might still poop every day, but they don't have a good poop every day. And they can still land up becoming um, constipated. Um, hey, diet and fluids. I know one nine-year-old girl with autism and she wouldn't take anything solid. Um, they, they managed to like with up and go with a high fiber um, and element, you know, but it was really hard because she had real um, sensitivities um, around um, chewing and, and uh, um, swallowing. Um, and, and yeah, like I mentioned before, um, habits are let are hard uh, um, to break. So here's an example. Um, and this was a, a girl that uh, probably about three or four years ago, and I always remember it because, um, um, you know, the, the, the change in her um, coming out and out of nappies and um, being... Um, continent with support so not she wasn't fully independent but she was continent with regular and um, prom prompt time but um, to see her come into the clinic with a lovely dress on rather than um, dungarees um, was just um, lovely um, she did have full support in residential um, care and really our our aim you know was to uh, reduce the soy line, remove the nappy, and maintain continence with external um, prompting. Um, she did play with her feces. So that's why she was in dungarees and, um, and onesies at night to stop her getting into her um, pull up. Um, she was from the charts that was that was completed by the staff. 
she was constipated, so she was commenced on laxator. And um, hey, the fluid intake was a problem. We added just a bit of pink food colouring. Um, you could, you know, mineral drop, you know, something that the kid will buy into, really. Or water rich foods like watermelon, cucumber, um, a lot of straw, but, you know, a lot of um, foods do have um, more water than uh, protein or um, carbs in them. Okay. Um, do document you know you will know if we're if we're getting success and we're having improvement if it's documented and then it's always good to know hey look at the look where we started and look how far we've come even though the staff will say oh my goodness I don't feel we've gotten very far you know and I always just take them back to the um, beginning and say hey we have actually made um, some progress um, here and it's worth celebrating and it let's go Let's carry on. Let's get to the next um, step. How are we going to do this? Um, and um, we did get over the, the, the plane with feces um, by um, the staff introducing tactile play with um, pink Play-Doh and other stuff. And that certainly um, um, reduced her need, um, you know, for uh, um, going into her nappy. And um, so this was sort of the overall um, management. And what was buy-in for her is that she had a favourite song that she loved and would and it would be repeated over and over again. And so we used that song for when she was doing her toilet time. And we, we agreed that we would just start with her doing... Um, focusing on getting the poops in, in the toilet, you know, because the wheeze was going to be every hour, every, you know, so it's like, no, let's just, let's just, and you know, focus on that. And especially with her being on um, black certificates and her poos being um, quite um, loose. And um, it became a habit. So it was like toilet time, you know, toilet, staff, would take her there and then they would sing the song you are my sunshine my only son. I'm not going to sing it um but it was an old Morecambe and Wise um, song and I always remember them singing it and doing the dance to it as well and um he it took a long long time and it was intensive but after a year she was in no nappy they were able to reduce her anti-anxiety medication and uh, she was um, a much happier child. Um, she wasn't as um, violent. So it had a huge impact. Getting her bells and bladder sorted out had a huge impact on her behaviour um, and also helped her make better decisions in her brain, the fact that we were able to reduce her anti-anxiety medications. Um, I had another boy. He loved Boney M, Rivers of Babel. So find out what um, is their passion, what they really um, love playing with or listening to or, you know, and, and try and bring that in because it's, it's happy for them. It makes them feel good. And we want them to feel good with the habit of going to the toilet when they need to um, eliminate what I will say is that, and I can hear, oh, yeah, it's great. There's staff there and they get breaks every, you know, that, that you know. And I agree, parents don't get the luxury of having breaks and having time out. So it is hard. Okay. And that's where um, it's great if we can get the um, school team um, on um, board. And funding for funding um, you can get high health needs um, funding and I think it can be up to sometimes 15 hours a week if it's absolutely um, necessary and obviously a number of our kids do have teacher aids and do have um, um, ORS um, funding uh, you know and they're in a learning um, support um, unit so you know that this is sort of a diagram and it's my four Bs. And really, if there's an imbalance in one, 
it's going to have an impact um, on the other. And sometimes you don't know if there's an imbalance in, say, the bowels or the bladder, but you notice there is a change in their um, um, behaviour. And, hey, if, if the brain is a bit wonky or it's an overdrive with ADHD, um, the connections just sometimes go astray and they get lost. And then the child um, is likely to hold on or have pee, poo and wee um, accidents. And certainly um, I've had a number of kids with ADHD and um, the, the incidence of uh, poo and wee issues are four times higher uh, um, in, in them. So don't worry too much about this um, diagram, but I, I do feel I'd like to explain it um, a little bit. Um, you know, because it is it is all a physiological uh, response and the brain ultimately is in charge. So like the brain, um, you know, releases uh, hormones um, that um, then go to the adrenal glands, which sit on top of the um, kidneys. And then they will um, release uh, cortisol, um, which is a stress um, hormone. And um, that can have a negative impact on the uh, gastrointestinal system and the um, urinary um, system. And many of our kids, um, you know, they, they tend to produce more of the stress hormone cortisol, that the, the world and the environment around them is quite overwhelming. And they do become stressed. And it is a physiological response, which then has an impact um, on the body, particularly the elimination uh, um, system. And, and I've always said, you know, yes, mind over matter, but um, next to the brain, you know, the gut particularly is the next most um, sensitive um, um, organ. And hey, this is really, um, you know, quite complicated. But I just want to, to draw you to the, the two different automatic um, uh, systems within our central nervous system and our peripheral um, nervous system. And really just take you down um, to um, what happens when, um, which is the sympathetic, where that's the fight, flight, fear response, and that's when the, the child's got the tigger brain or the meerkat brain. Look at what's happening in the intestines. It slows it down. It slows the peristalsis down. What happens in the bladder? You're, it relaxes the bladder and the sphincters, and they're more likely to have um, bladder leakage. Um, so you kind of want to try and address that and, and um, dampen down that side of the nervous system and really try and um, improve and bring to the fore um, the parasympathetic, which helps, and it's all through the vagus nerve, which um, helps to um, relax the body and then have that positive um, impact on the uh, elimination um, system. Again, easier said than done. Okay, and um, this is something from um, the training that I did as a relaxed kids coach. And I do talk to children about their brain function and how it works and how it's in charge. Like, you know, uh, it's like the computer of um, the body. And um, you've got your prefrontal cortex, which is your thinking brain. And I call it the owl brain. And when they're in the clinic, I have an owl, I have an elephant, I have, I actually use a tigger, I prefer um, tigger, but the, 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 the mere cat. But you know, the, the owl brain is, is really, um, you know, the executive um, functioning. And that's what um, helps the, the child with learning, with focusing, with planning. And, um, you know, and, and it's not apparently, it's not fully developed in females till the 25 years old, which I didn't know, but that's what's said. But in males, it's actually slightly older. Hmm. Anyway, um, but, you know, for our kids, that, that prefrontal, that owl brain 
is developing all the time. And again, it can take longer to mature in our kids um, that have a de developmental, have um, additional um, needs. Then you have the, um, the hippocampus, which is sort of, um, uh, you can see it there. And it's not, I thought it would be called a hippo, but no. Hippos, apparently, I don't know how they've done the research, don't have good memories. So it's actually called the elephant brain because the elephant um, does not forget. Um, again, I don't know how they know that, but that's just the way it is. And that that, that is what, um, you know, um, stores all our memories, good and bad. And, you know, that is where we can get that the, the child, if they have a bad memory, um, will um, trigger off a response, the wrong response from the owl brain where he, oh, this was bad, I didn't like this, we avoid. So this is in the case of constipation, that was really painful. I'm going to avoid going to the toilet. I am going to hold on. So that is the message that the elephant brain sends to the owl brain, who then sends it down to the bottom, okay? And it can take um, a lot of, you know, um, uh, it can take a long time to um, change the signal um, around. Um, and then the, the, the last part, which is uh, the amygdala and um, it's kind of just like it's just a tiny little um, almond shape there and really um, that is our uh, fight flight fear um, freeze really um, response it's our alarm system to keep us uh, out of um, danger and it does it's a bit, it's very emotional and it controls our feelings and the way that that um, we react to um, um, stimuli. And you're already getting the, the feeling that, hey, this is, you know, that a lot of our kids, that's, that's um, how they function every single day, is that the owl brain um, has floated away and doesn't engage an awful lot. It's predominantly that they're... Um, functioning on their uh, um, meerkat. Um, and, and, you know, the meerkat, they're always up and ready to go, you know, ready, um, ready for danger. And, um, you know, that is exhausting. It's exhausting um, and for these, these, especially if kids are like that, that they're on um, high alert. And um, it can make them, it can make it difficult for them to make good choices. Um, and, um, you know, uh, um, to learn. Toilet training involves all of these areas of the brain, and they all have to be in balance. So if one overrides the other, then it will lead to problems with um, toilet um, training. And how do we, ch you know, this is a million dollar question. It's not easy okay with her severe child with um, autism she was on anti-anxiety medication to try and calm her meerkat brain my relaxed kids training tries to do that as well and um and to try and engage the owl brain uh, more but also um emotions and memories and good feelings that that um, through mindfulness and relaxation um, we can get um, these three areas of the brain uh, working in harmony and um, being more balanced. Um, I have put the website up there um, for, because they, they've got a lot of wonderful free information that you can download, um, and it's relaxkids.com. Um, you know, so let's get on to it. When to start toilet training. 
So uh, there's actually more. I should have put I put two, but there's actually probably four um, when they are ready that they can indicate in some way that they are wet or soiled. They are dry overnight, and that they can they can meet their needs themselves as if hungry, and that they can sit for ten minutes at a table. You know, my boy, the eight year old with um, Chard syndrome, he didn't. He, he never really sat still much at all. So. You know, that's an indication as, as how well are we going to do with this toilet training. So if a child cannot get to the kitchen to indicate hunger, he is unlikely to get to the bathroom to indicate that he has to pee or it has to be with a lot more external um, prompting and yeah, external support. Um, however, if they don't see these signs, um, you know, can they remain dry for a couple of hours? Do you think they've got a mental age of 18 to 24 months? And, you know, you've really got to rule out medical problems like constipation and urine um, infections. And the biggest thing probably, are you emotionally ready to go on this um, journey uh, of um, discovery? And if you're not, you know, if there's other stressors going on in your life, just wait, just, you know, because it, it will totally consume your every day, it will consume. Okay, so I look on um, toilet training um, as you're 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 the uh, trainer, you're the director, and you've got to get your uh, orchestra tuned up and all on the same page before you even start. So, like Andre Review, I don't know. I, I love watching his concerts and. They're, they're extremely lovely to the eye and the pretty dresses, like princess dresses that these um, uh, um, ladies um, wear. So, hey, you're going to need instruments, equipment, okay? Um, what, uh, you know, how lang the language communication that's required, what, how does your child learn best? Uh, the song sheet, there'll be a different role. You know, you, you really want a good team um, around you um, to make the make it com complete because they're not just at home. You know, they could be at grandparents. They could be at school. They could be an after-school programme. And really it's it's making sure that the, they, uh, uh, you know, are all on the same page um, with regards to ensuring a good good toileting and a good toileting routine and um, feedback okay and your child will want to be part of that team you're the central part so what will make them want to be in that orchestra okay and, and really what is the main instrument in an orchestra I'm, I'm not sure well for Andre it's obviously the violin uh probably it would be a piano, you know. So anyway, it doesn't matter. But um, we need to look at clear, open, constructive communication, whether it's verbal, nonverbal, visual, tactile signals. You know, like sometimes it's quite good when with, um, as, as you have a signal, you know, toilet, you know, um, or, you know, just, uh, you know, that, that, you, that the child um, could recognise. Um, sign language. You know, I um, did a booklet for this eight-year-old who was deaf, and it was Fireman Sam helps um, so and you know, Johnny to go um, to the toilet. Um, and it had, along with the pictures, really very colourful and bright, um, had also the sign language for going um, put for um, going for a wee. So um, the pre-cursors, um, I'll just move me up a bit because you can't see it all, is it? Uh, yeah, the pre-cursors um, to starting uh, um, um, toilet um, training um, is really just what I've said before. 
that you you need to be in the right headspace and that there's nothing else that's going to interfere or cause stress. Again, I know that the best laid plans of mice and men, this is um, Rabbi Burns from Scotland, a, a famous poem, um, best laid plans of mice and men often go astray. So it, you start off, but things can, life, that's life. Life can get in the way. All right, um, but it's going to be time intensive. Clear your calendar as best you can to start the toilet training. A lot of people actually last year when it was lockdown and they had four or five weeks, they, they you know, that a lot of families did get quite good success um, starting the toilet training name because there was a good team. There was mum and dad there and hopefully they were both on the same page. Avoid Facebook publicity that you are starting toilet training. Keep it on a need-to-know basis. Toileting is quite private. You know, and um, we shouldn't be sharing our kids' sort of toileting issues with everybody. You know, um, it's their body. And um, we've got to be respectful that that we like privacy when we go to uh, the bathroom. Um, so we should give that right, you know, respect that for the child um, as well. Um, and um, it's amazing how many people have opinions on toilet training theories and it will confuse you. You know, you're just going to have to filter them out. And and I had it with my own boy. You know, like we adopted him when he was like 18 months of age and I had granny saying, hey, you need to get him out of nappies, you know, um, mainly because she didn't like changing dirty bums and things. But... Um, you know, is is you need you know, I taught I had my kids toilet trained by the time they were two and whatnot. And I said, Well, no, it's too big a change and he's really just getting used to be getting used to us and getting used to a new home. And um even when I did start the um toilet um training, it did backfire because I didn't know he had brain damage at that time and so I thought, right, we will We'll give it a go. Once he'd been with us for like six months, well, it was just a complete disaster. He he didn't understand and it just became too um, stressful. He didn't know what was expected of him and he struggled to communicate his, his he struggled to communicate that that's, you know, that he was needing the toilet or whatever. So we had lots and lots of um, uh, um, accidents. And... I quite like this one, being a mumby. Okay, and yeah, you know, that's kind of where you might um, get to uh, um, once you, um, and it's a long journey, all right? Um, It is a bit like um, doing a a marathon rather than a sprint. But keep calm and believe that you can do it. Have that positive mindset, all right? And trust your abilities as being the best teacher for your um, uh, um, child. Um, and get one, get one or two people that will listen, but not give too much advice. That they will listen to understand rather than respond, that, that it just gives you a vent. It gives you, you know, to, because it is, you, you get so um, frustrated. So you do need that catharsis. You do need that um, um, release. So here is my um, seven piece for um, toilet um, training. And I have a, a, a webinar on just toilet, um, seven piece for toilet training for just kids really. But this is um, a bit a bit more for the additional. Okay, so um, I've turned it around a bit because I think plan, 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 prepare um, is, is imperative, okay? Um, obviously, play is extremely important. And I'll go into each one in more um, detail. Practice, patience, and this big long word, perseverance. Um, Praise, and 
he, the last one, uh, be positive, even when the going gets tough, okay? Uh, remain uh, um, positive. Go at the child's pace. They will soon tell you through their behavior if you're moving too um, quickly. And, you know, we have to be aware that um, there will be hurdles, uh, particularly sensory um, hurdles. And I will touch on that uh, um, uh, quite a bit um, um, later on. Okay, so plan well for success. Gather your team um, together and brainstorm. And always just, hey, we all fail. You know, I tried with my boy and I had to reset and I did feel I'd failed. But then, you know, hindsight's a wonderful thing. I realized that, you know, he, he was at a lower uh, um, developmental age. Um, so first attempt in learning. I always look at fail as first attempt in learning. And, and go back to the drawing board and say, right, okay, we'll take a breather and let's see how we can adapt things, you know. Get a baseline, um, you, you know, and there's lots of charts available, but a good chat, make it personal, keep it simple. Um, the, the data that you gather is, is easy to uh, analyze. Colours are good. You know, it's always good to have colours because it's more interesting. And, and yeah, as I say, make it easy to compare. Um, a good book that um, I've read from cover to cover a few times, and it's The Potty Journey by J. Kukav. I can't say her name. Kukav, And And um, But one of the very first things that um, we should start um, doing is um, changing your child's nappy in the bathroom. That's if they don't have toilet fears, okay, because that is another, that's, that's, that's quite difficult to do that if you've got um, quite a big active child and they keep running out of the uh, um, bathroom. But the reason why I'm saying that is that it's just starting to put that association there that all who's in ways, um should, or anything to do with elimination should be in the bathroom. That's where poos and peas happen. All right, and um, make the environment a happy place. Um, make it fun for um, the child. And I'll talk a bit more um, about that. So, hey, um, read and research. And I've, I'll go back so that you can um, make uh, a note. Um, there's it's the uh, potty journey and uh, teaching toileting. And I am going to say the teach toileting, the revolutionary approach, is not one that um, I practically uh, advised <laughs> uh, because it, it does um, get the child to um, pee on the floor in the bathroom. And then gradually they move to peeing and pooing in the toilet. But apparently, and, and there's been huge success with this um, book by um, Deborah um, Byler, uh, particularly with kids with um, uh, quite um, significant um, uh, autism. Plan well um, for success. I've just put this chat that's probably too complicated for the majority of our kids. You've got to keep it um, simple. Um, you're going to come ar along um, lots of different toilet training methods um, to use. Uh, the Dior method, sit and wait, fixed sedge habit training, blah, 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 um, and applied behavioral um, analysis. And... Um, you know, that can work, and it's the ABCs, the antecedent behaviour, consequences of behaviour, and looking at positive reinforcers to encourage um, toileting. And I think um, uh, on our the Continents New Zealand, they had an awareness day, uh, or was it on the members page, um, a really good um, presentation um, by... 
uh, um, Christina and Spatsky um, are be change behavioral um, uh, uh, um, support and behavioral analysis. And um, yeah, she, she went into a huge amount of detail around um, toileting for kids with uh, um, additional needs. So plan, what are we going to focus on first? Okay, um, no right or wrong here. Uh, if they're constipated, you probably want to focus on the bowels and get the bowels right. Um, and sometimes it is easier to start with the bowels because it's it's there's less visits to the toilet, basically. It's practically. Where if you're starting with these, it's like every hour, every hour, you know, and you're you're hovering like a a, a hawk. Um, fluids, I cannot stress enough. The, you know, the amount of children when I do an assessment just don't drink nowhere near enough. And the, um, you know, I, like with my own boy, I just put a cup of water in his hands or a bottle of water, drink. And that's what we have to do, okay? 80% of a child's body is made up of water. So, it, uh, you know, it's just if, if we don't ensure that they've got good water intake, we're not, we're not um, going to do well um, with um, gaining um, um, continence. Uh, if they don't have enough, they can get a real twitchy, irritable um, bladder, increases the risk of urine infections and bladder leakage. Um, so monitor that. Monitor what they're drinking and get them to drink it as cupfuls rather than sipping. Cupfuls means that you get better expansion of the bladder. It makes the bladder work more effectively so that, that um, yeah, it, it's just uh, going to improve, ensure a healthy bladder and that, that they will um, have good voiding, good, good urination um, each um, time. The plan. Now, um, again, there is no right or wrong. Uh, potty or toilet it's entirely uh, you know in the hands of the directors or whatever as to what you would like to try and use um, maybe you know involve the child in what they would like to um, sit on and there's amazing thrones out there, there are amazing toilets now you know singing toilets musical toilets it, it, it's just unbelievable the choice that's out there um but again some kids um you know little is more you don't want overstimulation with some of our um children you know because then they don't relax and you know if they don't relax they will not um relax their pelvic floor and they will not have they will not then um, perform um and it's really aiming for the child to be able to sit on the toilet as best they can without any um, adult support. So you might need more like handrails and that's where an occupational therapist, if it's required, would, would need to come on board. Um, I do love the Peppa Pig um, toilet seat and I don't know if it oink oinks when they sit on it, um, but I just think that is great for some of our um, um, children. Um, I wouldn't have had any problem if I had come across a racing car uh, a racing seat um, toilet uh, um, for my lad because he would have spent ages on there and I probably would have given him a pretend steering wheel and he would have been happy as. And um, so, yeah, uh, you know, what we're looking at is, is with the toilet, there's a huge big hole to nowhere. Okay, and for some of these children... They're going to put their bum on it and they don't know what's down there, you know. And we see all these adverts about these bugs, these bacteria that look like little monsters and we use the toilet duct to get rid of them. Our kids have an amazing imagination and they might just think that this monster is going to come up and bite the bum, you know. 
Um, so no wonder it's it's uh, this change um, of moving from the secure feeling of a warm nappy to um, sitting on this this thing that's got a huge big hole um, you know, in the middle. Um, I thought I'd just give you what happened when I had one kid who came to the um, clinic and uh, he had autism, he was non-verbal. They'd got him toilet trained fantastic. He was happy in his that bathroom and, um, you know, he you know, was more or less independent. Um, and, uh, you know, it, yeah, he'd, he'd done really well, um, role play and all that, you know, the usual seven piece of toilet, toilet training. Um, they decided to uh, upgrade their bathroom. And you could imagine uh, what happened. Um, it didn't go down well. And he went, um, from being con continent um, to having soiling accidents and weight, you know, and having um, quite significant um, constipation. Um, so he, it's all well and good having these modern clinical toilets, you know, these clean toilets, but they're not they're not very cosy um, for the child. They're not very comforting for the. Um, Chelsea, that 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 one there looks like one that you would see in a hospital, you know. So yeah, um, what is really essential, regardless of what equipment that that you get or whatever, it, you know, um, is it's it's physically impossible. Once a child has is getting up and running, walking, running, um, they've developed really good muscle tone. And that will prevent most of the time from them having, um, I, you know, from them having a, you know, it will, they won't poo very well. And it defies me, you know, very few people can poo standing up unless they've got diarrhea. You do have to sit down in order to relax the pelvic floor and to relax the, what we call the pubis rectus um, muscle. So the ideal position is not just sitting, it's actually in a squatting uh, um, position. That is the physiological um, position because that's the way our bodies are made. All right. So um, regardless, they might not want to sit on the toilet. They might not want to sit on the potty. Get them just squatting on the floor in the nappy and pooping. Get them on a, on a, on a seat. Um, a little a little seat where where they can still be in the squatting um, position. I want to bring up about um, some positioning that I've seen, and particularly I've seen it with children with Down syndrome. And kids with Down syndrome do have um, poor muscle tone. They could be a bit floppy, you know. And if you think that's with their arms and their legs that's kind of the same with their um, internal muscles and the, the bowels a muscle, the bladder's a muscle. And, you know, I always say, say to people, how do they sit on the toilet? You know, can you show me? And uh, as I say, with Down syndrome, I've, I've seen a few kids with Downs that they sit like this girl uh, there, the two girls on the left, and they sit with their legs up and crossed over. They've not got them um, down uh, on on the floor or on a footstool. Um, and um, so that has to be uh, changed. And again, that is a habit that they've done and it's not going to be easy. And why sitting? So you can see this, this girl who's drawing that she's sitting with her knees forward and her, and her legs out um, to the side. Um, that's been found to, to weaken their core um, strength and um, it, it can affect their internal uh, muscles around their pelvic floor. 
Um, and there has been studies to show it can cause dislocation of the um, hip as well. But from a, um, a bladder and bowel emptying point of view, if they sit like that for, for prolonged time and, and, all, and all the time, then you do have to um, change that and get them sitting um, change their um, position of sitting. So this is this is a YouTube um, video that you all need to look at, and it's called the um, Pooping Unicorn. And I thought it was a joke at first when I first saw it, um, but no, it's actually right because I ordered one, and I have a squatty potty in my bathroom, and it definitely reduces elimination time. I can guarantee that. Okay, so your planning and communication. Um, use the method that we, they learn uh, um, best. Um, most tend to be visual, um, but a combination of all the senses are really um, quite uh, um, good. And, and like the autistic girl, it was the sunshine song that, that was her cue um, to, you know, to do a poop um, on the um, toilet. And I'm a great believer that less is more. Uh, so keep the information short, simple, the same and slow. And you do have to repeat, repeat, repeat and repeat again. My son is 23 and I still have to prompt him to clean his teeth okay, every morning. When he's with us, but yeah, he would. It, he just, it's just not on his radar. Okay. Same with the, you know, um, is that you, you, you always hope that through repetition it will then become a habit. But yeah, you, you, you just have to work hard at it. And you know, like today, you're going to be a big boy, going to pee and poop in the toilet. I'm going to teach you how to do this uh, again. Um, do you want the nappy on or off? And it might just be a very slow step-by-step -step removal of the nappy if the child is showing extreme anxiety, sensory issues, toilet avoidance. And and I've come, I've had a girl, a six-year-old girl who has been extreme, and we have had to involve the uh, pediatric occupational um, therapist again. Um, it generally has to be through, it's a private um, service and um, most um, areas should should have them. You may be able to, through your child development unit, um, access a paediatric occupational um, therapist that has experience um, around um, the sensory sensitivities and uh, getting over that, the hurdles of toilet avoidance. And as I say, it could be a gradual journey from pooping in the bedroom uh, to getting to uh, the uh, um, toilet. Um, and use play. Use play. You, um, and, and you can gradually take that play, whatever they like playing, you can move it gradually to the hall and then outside the bathroom and then inside the bathroom so you can kind of do it in that way and I put you know you've obviously got your sign language and that is um, sometimes a good thing to use um, as well um, plan uh, again I, I told you I'd bring up quite a lot because sensory is, is a big deal all right and um one thing I've learned quite a lot is about interoception, is, you know, what it feels like for them inside their bodies. And, uh, yeah, I, um, I'm not an expert um, on this, um, but I do remember one boy who I do feel um, had issues with an interoception and that, that he really felt that he was going to die if he pooped in the toilet. That it was quite safe at coming out, you know, um, softly in his underpants. But he, he thought he was losing part of his body 
and and he really got extremely upset that that um, you know and and again part of it was because he was constipated um, as well that um, extreme uh, um, fear that they were losing something important from inside their body and again it could be repetition to say hey the poo is the rubbish from your body okay it's okay to let go of that it's okay um and um you know definitely um if there are significant issues in any of these areas i'm not an expert in that side of things and that is really where um you know, an occupational therapist um, would be um, um, a good person to um, bring um, on board. Um, just, a, just a few things, like um, a lot of kids don't like the, the noise of the wee or the poo splashing and splashing and you get back, back you know, on, on their bum. It just put some toilet paper in there first so that they get a soft landing or it's absorbed that it's that there's less likely any splash back. Um, they might not like the toilet flushing. I know that you know for some you don't flush, you wait until they go out and then flush the toilet. Air fresheners, some of them love air fresheners and some don't. You know, some of them really struggle with this. They've got a real auditory um sensitivity um, to um, smell. Um, uh, a cold toilet seat, you know, um, and these old weatherboard houses, my goodness, these toilets can be like freezers. They're so cold and they've got to put their lovely warm bum on a cold toilet seat, you know. It, it would put me off, I must admit. Um, and if they have vestibular, you know, things affecting their balance, then they might have a fear of actually falling down um, the toilet and going, yeah, going out to sea or whatever. You know, it's an, their imagination. I've, I've heard so many stories. Um, if they have poor uh, muscle tone, proprioceptive, you know, you maybe have to look at building up um, core strength. And again, an occupational therapist could do exercises to help um, the child build up their core um, um, strength. Um, so again, that is um, speciality, um, you know, in itself. But I think working as a team so that you get all the right people um, in your orchestra. Okay, so plan. And again, I've just put up an example from the internet. Might be too complicated for a lot of our kids that you've got to just break it down. Because really, where all we are really wanting is for them to get it in the toilet, you know. A lot of the other things is just an add-on, but we really want to be, you know, having success so that we're not having to clean wet and dirty um, undies. And, um, you know, one, one of the talks that was at a conference a few years ago, I think it was a mum, Louise, with her child who had severe intellectual um, disability. And I've started doing that with um, a number of my kids that come to my clinic. It's a visual sequence, but not just any picture, them, so that they know it's, for what, it's what they need to do because it's them doing that and you take pictures at each sort of um, step. So you might only start with a couple of pictures and then you add on to that. But, you know, and she felt for her, her boy, it did work for a period of um, time. And keep the words the same. And just be aware that you might still be saying these things when they're in their teenage years because some, it's a long long haul, long process, that you have to be their pee and poo monitor for as long as you need them, as they need you to be that. That's what I'm trying to say. Play. This is my favourite part. I love I love playing um, with um, the kids. And um, it's very clear, okay, that um, play is the world for the child. It's how they feel safe. Uh, it reduces stress and it yields um, results. And it also helps them work through um, change and any sort of new new things. So here we've got to have, you know, and I remember one parent saying, we have a poo party every day. 
um, after dinner um, in the bathroom. And it's great fun. So that if that's what, you know, um, is have a poo party. Some kids, now, you know, like privacy, you know, and we've got to respect that as, as well, okay? Um, you know, so again, what will work for your um, um, child? Um, you can do role play. I've done it with a, um, with Teddy or Winnie the Pooh. Teddy needs to go to the toilet and just go through the, the little story um, with that. Um, there's lots of uh, pee and poo songs, books. Um, yeah, that you know, it's it's endless. And the one thing is change, you know, to make it interesting for them, even though our kids don't like change in their routine or habit, when it comes to play, you know, they, um, they, they like to have new things added to keep them interested and sitting long enough. Okay, so um, here is just some, and this is a lovely toilet. I quite like this um, toilet. It's a nice colour and, it, and it's nice and uh, inviting, okay? And uh, so just some ideas. You know, I remember oh, my, my younger sister had baby alive and um, she loved toilet training the doll. Okay, but it did help when it was her, her toilet training. There's the wiggle toilet song. Um, you can get them to to get them to be using their muscles and knowing because a lot of kids don't know how to to push on the toilet, you know. So sometimes you've got to get them moving back and forward. So I sometimes get them to lean forward and to throw soft balls uh, um, into um, a basket, and and um, hey, that can keep them occupied for ages, you know. Um, nursery rhymes, um, as I say, I've mentioned it before, is um, sort of make it um, friendly. A toilet activity box, a treasure chest of wonderful things for their child so that they will actually sit and relax and take their time on the toilet. So I've got a few examples there and, and I have lots of these in the clinic, apart from when my dog comes in and starts. He's already chewed about three of these um, squidgy, squeezy balls. So there is the, and it's wonderful. I like the toilet song because it's really, it's really catchy. Okay, so it's a good one to use. So we've gone from plan to play to practice. And you may need to uh, practice for a number of weeks with the child's nappy on and then progress um, slowly and you know let them get used to the toileting equipment okay I often say don't bring it out until you mean business okay and that's really important okay um, when you decide to start training toilet training that's when you bring out the equipment don't just leave it around and and you know and uh, suggest you know is that that Start strong, if you like. And there's 13 steps, would you believe it, to being totally independent with toilet time. So just focus on the essential ones. And and really, for, for my boy, um, it was that, that you know, I'm, I'm peeing. I had to just watch him for the wiggle signs. And then it would, it would be a case of um, toilet. And I would just get him to the toilet quickly it took a long time for him to acknowledge the signal from his bladder or his belt you know i have to go pee that that's that's you know so that can take quite a while okay and it will depend on the child's um disability uh development um and there's no no time span or anything like that. Um, for neurotypical or ordinary kids, there is a rough like between one to three weeks. But that's just the beginning. A lot, a lot of parents think, yeah, yeah, I've, I've achieved it. And then they sit back. But actually, we, we just need to keep on keeping on um, monitoring and checking and cueing and, you know, what I call elimination communication. Okay, and getting a really keep into that routine. And 
keep asking them when they when they start school or you know I've known some oh do you know when your child last pooed and and they don't have a clue you know and then they wonder why the child's soiling their pants all the time you know so anyway um you document your journey because that well and I in in the clinic I have parents that come and say oh I don't feel we're getting very far and I said right let's go back and I have I do a a severity scores at the beginning and as we go through but I I said look at my first letter and how bad it was look at it now you know so even you know keeping good documentation and getting the parents to keep like a diary and um, if it's really hard you know get back up from your team don't don't be scared you know don't feel that that you're that you're not doing enough as a parent, or what else? What 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 else could I be doing? Okay, you express your uh, frustration because there's no doubt about it. This is the hardest skill, the most important skill that you will ever ever teach your child. The fourth P, patience. And I have to use that all the time and think very carefully sometimes before I say anything to my son. So use the duck mantra as the patience of a duck, okay? Is that they're lovely, floating along on the top, nice and smooth, or everything's lovely and calm, but underneath the feet are going like the clappers, okay? And inside your heart, you're going like, you know, you're really stressed, you're really struggling with it. But try not to show that. Try try not to show that um, to your child because they, they're finely tuned to you and they will watch your body language and your facial expressions your tone of voice, the way you're standing, you know, you're like, you know, you know, it's amazing. Most, a lot of what we communicate, it's not just the words, it's it's our whole body, our face, our posture, our tone, everything. And they are, honestly, my son was really, 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 I had to to work hard on that one, I must admit, that was was quite hard as, as, as trying to be a duck. Okay, and and if you know you're starting to get wound up like a spring, then then take time. Okay, walk away, back off, take time, take you know slow deep breathing will help get your owl brain back um, into gear. Let somebody else come in and just give you a break again. We never really had that luxury either, um, because we yeah we, we didn't get many babysitters for our lad when he was um, younger because he was hard work. So fifth P is perseverance. Okay, and I'm going to, it says it in a nutshell. Without per you know while perseverance is no guarantee of success. There can be no success without it. And when you sometimes look look back, um, often it's the the cause can you know that, that things go a bit haywire is is the the parents' approach is maybe they're too intense, they're too anxious, they're expecting far too much from um, their child. So you you know, you have to um, sometimes uh, um, back off. And yes, there is going to be um, lots and lots of um, uh, accidents. Um, I did have one boy uh, with Asperger's and he he really had quite fixated behaviour, especially around the toilet and had quite um, rigid, rigid routines and that he would not go to school until he had performed on a poop on the toilet. During this time, his parents separated, and that 
because there was change from one house to the other that did lead to regression and constipation. And it, it did result having to be in pull-ups for a while. Um, but getting both parents on the same page and that they kept things that his fixate, fixate, fixations and his rigid toileting behaviour, that they, they realised that if they, you know, and they actually achieved, um, achieved a good um, toilet um, routine. And because they were singing the same tune, okay, they, they'd, they'd all tuned up nicely. Um, so they, it was a lovely, like Andre review, a beautiful, beautiful music from the team, okay, from the orchestra. So praise, okay, um, a lot, we, yeah, we don't praise our kids enough and I'm probably guilty as the next um, person. When things are going well, we don't often say anything, okay, and that's when we should be saying more. So, and, and, and label the praise, okay, don't just say a fantastic, we'll put the fantastic for, that, you know, great what, you know, great. Just like what they do at school, you know, they have these um, reward certificates and they are very clear in how, what they're getting rewarded for, what they're getting praised for. So we need to do that too. And it has to be for these, these kids that, you know, um, have got problems around their brain and development, an immediate reward, because it'll be quickly forgotten. Immediate reward will ensure that that behaviour is likely to be reinforced and not get another reward. Big hugs, if they like hugs, they might not. Um, share the, pre like you would with, um, or, you know, our kids. As I always remember when my boy put for the first time in the potty, it was like, you know, we phoned granny, we phoned granddad, we phoned, you know, a friend, you know, we phoned so many people to say, hey, we've had success, you know. Um, and, it speaks, you know, play down the accidents. But you do have to, um, I, I still feel that a lot of people say, oh, um, you know, praise the good, ignore the bad. But they might not know what bad is. So I think, you know, I think we need to um, state the facts in a neutral tone. No emotion, just state the fact. Pee and poo goes in the potty or the toilet, not on the floor, not in your pants. Okay, um, but keep trying, keep, and I know it's hard, but keep the emotion out of it and behave. And, and I love this term behavioral currency. Okay, and it has to be sustainable and that the child will buy into it. The 14 year old just loved her pink cookies, her hundreds and thousands of cookies. They were just little, they, were, they weren't great big things, you know. So, you know, and for my boy, um, it, it, it would often revolve around cars. Yeah. Okay. So positive. And I, and I can relate to all of these because um, toilet time is just one part of supporting and managing your child with additional needs. It can be very overwhelming and, and uh, complex and there have been times where I I have just like this mother here all for an ordinary life and that with our kids there's and I, and I see it all that there's predictability in the unpredictable and I never see um, oh things are going well at the moment because often that's when it all goes haywire and I termed the word exhaustipation it is you, it is hard and that you're drowning just want to go in a cave and sleep and at times you feel so um, alone so you know these feelings are real and at times it is hard um, to stay positive it's a small word but it's hard 
to put it into um, practice. And I think we have to, uh, you know, look, and that's where we have to go back to the documentation. You know, you're looking at progress, not perfection. And that, that, you know, I've always been like like that, is that I have to fight for the things that I have wanted in my life. Nothing comes easy. You, you've got to work at it. And um, as, as a parent of a child, you know, with complex um, needs, it was actually the hardest part was not always managing my child at home. You know, it was actually teaching, not teaching my son about the world around him. It was actually teaching the world about my son because they uh, didn't acknowledge or accept that he did have a disability because he looked entirely normal. And so many do. They've got invisible disabilities. Children with Down syndrome, even though it's tough, people do, you can see that they have a, a disability. Um, and they tend to be more empathetic um, around that because it's, the, it's visual. We can see it. That's the way human nature um, um, is and I it's it's um, it's um, draining advocating and going out there and and uh, you know um, talking about their behaviours you know that that behaviours is a symptom and it, it's not that they're being deliberately difficult or awkward and it is extremely tiring actually I used to enjoy the school holidays because I didn't I didn't have to um continually explain my son's behavior to um and um, others especially at school so yes um parents oh be kind to yourself okay you are doing better than you realize okay it's it's tiring no one gets it right. Few people are always calm, you know. Yeah. Um, everyone gets gets overwhelmed. You take time out. You reset if you can. And again, I'm going to hear some. You don't get time out, you know. Um, and that celebrate everything that you have done and continue to do as you navigate this um, important um, role. And like I said, it is like climbing Mount Everest. And I have actually been in the Himalayas and I did get quite quite breathless. I didn't go to Everest, it was another mountain, but I obviously didn't go right the way to the top. And at times the going seemed impossible, but we, we would take a wee break, catch our breath, and we would carry on. We didn't give up. So, hey, it's, you know, we say it's like running a marathon and at times it's even more than that, okay? Um and continue prompting. Be there, poo or we monitor for as long as they need you to be in that. And, and be aware of their signals. And, you know, they, they've all got their own unique signals. And keep, and, and they're more likely in new environments um, need more support and supervision, okay? Um, stick to a good toilet. Um, routine once you've got it um, sussed and, and, and be vigilant. Um, however, if it's just that you're at your wit's end and you're at the end of your tether then it's a complete disaster, reset, take time out, okay, from a practical point of view and it may be, mean that they do have to go back into um, nappies, pull-ups for a while. And to finish, and I know I've talked for a, a long time, and this is just my final take-home uh, uh, message, is uh, make the most of the good times and the least uh, of um, the worst. And that today was tough, 
with a toilet train on. But tomorrow is a new day and it will, you know, start afresh tomorrow, just a clean slate and start afresh. So, and but be kind to yourself, all right? And sometimes you might not want to start afresh tomorrow. You might just want to have a few days um, off um, and then um, get back um, on that um, road, get back on that um, journey. And this, this photo here was taken at my son's um, after school club, which um, was a, we were very lucky, um, probably one of a kind for kids with high needs. And um, you can see that the lad with Down syndrome is sitting cross-legged. That's, you know, that's how they like to sit and they often do that on the top. But anyway, um, he still has the, the one of the staff members there with the blue on um, and Aaron is in the red jumper at, at the side, my boy. Um, she's still with him. Um, 11 years um, later. So, you know, we've had consistent, continuous um, support um, on our journey, um, you know, with um, our, our um, lad, um, which we are um, really thankful um, for. Um, so I hope that has given you guys, um, you know, some, an overview and some, you um, tips around um, encouraging or, or getting on to the toilet training. Uh, you know, if they do have bowel and bladder dysfunction, particularly constipation, you are going to um, need uh, uh, extra help from, uh, you know, like, you know, a, a continence um, clinic or um, a paediatrician. Um, so thanks for listening. And Continence New Zealand, they do have quite a lot of um, information leaflets that you can download. And there is a free um, helpline um, that uh, you can uh, phone and um, get um, some information um, and advice. Um, we've got our website and our Facebook page. So thanks for um, listening. All right then, bye.